Chapter Nine of Behind a Mask. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Behind a Mask, or A Woman's Power, by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Nine, Lady Coventry. When the first excitement of Edward's return had subsided, and before they could question him as to the cause of this unexpected visit. He told them that after dinner their curiosity should be gratified, and meantime he begged them to leave Miss Muir alone, for she had received bad news and must not be disturbed. The family with difficulty restrained their tongues and waited impatiently. Gerald confessed his love for Jean and asked his brother's pardon for betraying his trust. He had expected an outbreak, but Edward only looked at him with pitying eyes, and said sadly, "'You too. I have no reproaches to make.' for I know what you will suffer when the truth is known." "'What do you mean?' demanded Coventry. "'You will soon know, my poor Gerald, and we will comfort one another.' Nothing more could be drawn from Edward till dinner was over, the servants gone, and all the family alone together. Then, pale and grave, but very self-possessed, for trouble had made a man of him, he produced a packet of letters, and addressing himself to his brother, "'Jean Muir has deceived us all. I know her story. Let me tell it before I read her letters." "'Stop! I'll not listen to any false tales against her. The poor girl has enemies who belie her!' cried Gerald, starting up. "'For the honour of the family you must listen, and learn what fools she has made of us. I can prove what I say, and convince you that she has the art of a devil. Sit still ten minutes, then go if you will." Edward spoke with authority, and his brother obeyed him with a foreboding heart. "'I met Sidney, and he begged me to beware of her. Nay, listen, Gerald! I know she has told her story, and that you believe it, but her own letters convict her. She tried to charm Sidney as she did us, and nearly succeeded in inducing him to marry her. Rash and wild as he is, he is still a gentleman and when an incautious word of hers roused his suspicions, he refused to make her his wife. A stormy scene ensued, and hoping to intimidate him, she feigned to stab herself as in despair. She did wound herself, but failed to gain her point, and insisted upon going to a hospital to die. Lady Sidney, good simple soul, believed the girl's version of the story, thought her son was in the wrong, and when he was gone, tried to atone for his fault by finding Jean Muir another home. She thought Gerald was soon to marry Lucia, and that I was away, so sent her here as a safe and comfortable retreat." "'But, Ned, are you sure of all this? Is Sidney to be believed?' began Coventry, still incredulous. "'To convince you, I'll read Jean's letters before I say more. They were written to an accomplice, and were purchased by Sidney. There was a compact between the two women that each should keep the other informed of all adventures, plots, and plans, and share whatever good fortune fell to the lot of either. Thus Jean wrote freely, as you shall judge. The letters concern us alone. The first was written a few days after she came. Dear Hortense, another failure. Sidney was more wily than I thought. All was going well, when one day my old fault beset me. I took too much wine and I carelessly owned that I had been an actress. He was shocked and retreated. I got up a scene and gave myself a safe little wound to frighten him. The brute was not frightened, but coolly left me to my fate. I'd have died to spite him if I dared, but as I didn't I lived to torment him. As yet I have had no chance, but I will not forget him. His mother is a poor weak creature, whom I could use as I would and through her I found an excellent place—a sick mother, silly daughter, and two eligible sons. One is engaged to a handsome iceberg, but that only renders him more interesting in my eyes. Rivalry adds so much to the charm of one's conquests. Well, my dear, I went, got up in the meek style, intending to be pathetic, but before I saw the family I was so angry I could hardly control myself. Through the indolence of Monsieur the young master, no carriage was sent for me, and I intend he shall atone for that rudeness by and by. The younger son, the mother, and the girl received me patronizingly, and I understood the simple souls at once. Monsieur, as I shall call him, as names are unsafe, 
was unapproachable, and took no pains to conceal his dislike of governesses. The cousin was lovely, but detestable with her pride, her coldness, and her very visible adoration of Monsieur, who let her worship him like an inanimate idol as he is. I hated them both, of course, and in return for their insolence shall torment her with jealousy, and teach him how to woo a woman by making his heart ache. They are an intensely proud family, but I can humble them all, I think, by captivating the sons, and, when they have committed themselves, cast them off, and marry the old uncle, whose title takes my fancy." "'She never wrote that! It is impossible! A woman could not do it!' cried Lucia indignantly while Bella sat bewildered, and Mrs. Coventry supported herself with salts and fan. Coventry went to his brother, examined the writing, and returned to his seat, saying in a tone of suppressed wrath, "'She did write it. I posted some of those letters myself. Go on, Ned.' "'I made myself useful and agreeable to the amiable ones, and overheard the chat of the lovers. It did not suit me, so I fainted away to stop it, and excite interest in the provoking pair. I thought I had succeeded, but Monsieur suspected me, and showed me that he did. I forgot my meek role, and gave him a stage look. It had a good effect, and I shall try it again. The man is well worth winning, but I prefer the title, and as the uncle is a hale, handsome gentleman, I can't wait for him to die, though Monsieur is very charming, with his elegant languor, and his heart so fast asleep no woman has had power to wake it yet. I told my story, and they believed it though I had the audacity to say I was but nineteen, to talk Scotch, and bashfully confess that Sidney wished to marry me. Monsieur knows S., and evidently suspects something. I must watch him and keep the truth from him, if possible. I was very miserable that night when I got alone. Something in the atmosphere of this happy home made me wish I was anything but what I am. As I sat there trying to pluck up my spirits, I thought of the days when I was lovely and young, good and gay. My glass showed me an old woman of thirty, for my false locks were off, my paint gone, and my face was without its mask. Bah! How I hate sentiment! I drank your health from your own little flask, and went to bed to dream that I was playing Lady Tartuffe, as I am. Adieu! More soon." No one spoke as Edward paused, and taking up another letter, he read on. My dear creature, all goes well. Next day I began my task, and having caught a hint of the character of each, tried my power over them. Early in the morning I ran over to see the hall, approved of it highly, and took the first step toward becoming its mistress, by piquing the curiosity and flattering the pride of its master. His estate is his idol. I praised it with a few artless compliments to himself, and he was charmed. The cadet of the family adores horses. I risked my neck to pat his beast, and he was charmed. The little girl is romantic about flowers. I made a posy, and was sentimental, and she was charmed. The fair icicle loves her departed mamma. I had raptures over an old picture, and she thawed. Monsieur is used to being worshipped. I took no notice of him, and by the natural perversity of human nature, he began to take notice of me. He likes music. I sang, and stopped when he'd listened long enough to want more. He is lazily fond of being amused. I showed him my skill, but refused to exert it in his behalf. In short, I gave him no peace till he began to wake up. In order to get rid of the boy, I fascinated him, and he was sent away. Poor lad! I rather liked him, and if the title had been nearer, would have married him." "'Many thanks for the honour," and Edward's lip curled with intense scorn. But Gerald sat like a statue, his teeth set his eyes fiery, his brows bent, waiting for the end. The passionate boy nearly killed his brother, but I turned the affair to good account, and bewitched Monsieur by playing nurse, till Vashti, the icicle, interfered. Then I enacted injured virtue, and kept out of his way, knowing that he would miss me. I mystified him about S., by sending a letter where S. would not get it, and got up all manner of soft scenes to win this proud creature. I get on well and meanwhile privately fascinate Sir J. by being daughterly and devoted. He is a worthy old man, simple as a child, honest as the day, and generous as a prince. I shall be a happy woman if I win him, and you shall share my good fortune. So wish me success." 
This is the third, and contains something which will surprise you," Edward said, as he lifted another paper. Hortense, I've done what I once planned to do on another occasion. You know my handsome dissipated father married a lady of rank for his second wife. I never saw Lady H. but once, for I was kept out of the way. Finding that this good Sir J. knew something of her when a girl, and being sure that he did not know of the death of her little daughter, I boldly said I was the child, and told a pitiful tale of my early life. It worked like a charm. He told Monsieur, and both felt the most chivalrous compassion for Lady Howard's daughter, though before they had secretly looked down on me, and my real poverty and my lowliness. That boy pitied me with an honest warmth, and never waited to learn my birth. I don't forget that and shall repay it if I can. Wishing to bring Monsieur's affair to a successful crisis, I got up a theatrical evening and was in my element. One little event I must tell you, because I committed an actionable offence and was nearly discovered. I did not go down to supper, knowing that the moth would return to flutter about the candle, and preferring that the fluttering should be done in private, as Vashti's jealousy is getting uncontrollable. Passing through the gentleman's dressing-room, my quick eye caught sight of a letter lying among the costumes. It was no stage affair, and an odd sensation of fear ran through me as I recognised the hand of S. I had feared this, but I believe in chance, and having found the letter I examined it. You know I can imitate almost any hand. When I read in this paper the whole story of my affair with S. truly told, and also that he had made inquiries into my past life and discovered the truth, I was in a fury. To be so near success and fail was terrible, and I resolved to risk everything. I opened the letter by means of a heated knife-blade under the seal, therefore the envelope was perfect. Imitating S.'s hand, I penned a few lines in his hasty style, saying that he was at Baden, so that if Monsieur answered, the reply would not reach him, for he is in London, it seems. This letter I put into the pocket whence the other must have fallen, and was just congratulating myself on this narrow escape when Dean, the maid of Vashti, appeared as if watching me. She had evidently seen the letter in my hand, and suspected something. I took no notice of her, but must be careful, for she is on the watch. After this the evening closed with strictly private theatricals, in which Monsieur and myself were the only actors. To make sure that he received my version of the story first, I told him a romantic story of S.'s persecution, and he believed it. This I followed up by a moonlight episode behind a rose-hedge, and sent the young gentleman home in a half-dazed condition. <laughs> what fools men are!" "'She is right,' muttered Coventry, who had flushed scarlet with shame and anger, as his folly became known, and Lucia listened in astonished silence. "'Only one more, and my distasteful task will be nearly over,' said Edward, unfolding the last of the papers. "'This is not a letter but a copy of one written three nights ago. Dean boldly ransacked Jean Muir's desk while she was at the hall, and fearing to betray the deed by keeping the letter, she made a hasty copy which she gave me to-day, begging me to save the family from disgrace. This makes the chain complete now. Go now, if you will, Gerald. I would gladly spare you the pain of hearing this." "'I will not spare myself. I deserve it. Read on,' replied Coventry guessing what was to follow, and nerving himself to hear it. Reluctantly his brother read these lines. "'The enemy has surrendered. Give me joy, Hortense. I can be the wife of this proud monsieur if I will. Think what an honour for the divorced wife of a disreputable actor. I laugh at the farce, and enjoy it, for I only wait till the prize I desire is fairly mine, to turn and reject this lover who has proved himself false to brother, mistress, and his own conscience. I resolved to be revenged on both, and I have kept my word. For my sake he cast off the beautiful woman who truly loved him. He forgot his promise to his brother, and put by his pride to beg of me the worn-out heart that is not worth a good man's love. Ah, well, I am satisfied, for Vashti has suffered the sharpest pain a proud woman can endure, and will feel another pang when I tell her that I scorn her recreant lover, and give him back to her, to deal with as she will. Coventry started from his seat with a fierce exclamation, but Lucia bowed her face upon her hands, weeping, as if the pang had been sharper than even Jean foresaw. "'Send for Sir John! I am mortally afraid of this creature! Take her away! Do something to her! Oh, my poor Bella, what a companion for you! Send for Sir John at once!' 
cried Mrs. Coventry incoherently, and clasped her daughter in her arms, as if Jean Muir would burst in to annihilate the whole family. Edward alone was calm. "'I have already sent, and while we wait let me finish this story. It is true that Jean is the daughter of Lady Howard's husband, the pretended clergyman, but really a worthless man who married her for her money. Her own child died, but this girl, having beauty, wit, and a bold spirit, took her fate into her own hands, and became an actress. She married an actor, led a reckless life for some years, quarrelled with her husband, was divorced, and went to Paris, left the stage, and tried to support herself as governess and companion. You know how she fared with the Sydneys, how she has duped us, and but for this discovery would have duped Sir John. I was in time to prevent this, thank heaven. She is gone. No one knows the truth but Sydney and ourselves. He will be silent for his own sake we will be for ours, and leave this dangerous woman to the fate which will surely overtake her. Thank you. It has overtaken her, and a very happy one she finds it." A soft voice uttered the words, and an apparition appeared at the door, which made all start and recoil with amazement. Jean Muir leaning on the arm of Sir John. "'How dare you return!' began Edward, losing the self-control so long preserved. How dare you insult us by coming back to enjoy the mischief you have done? Uncle, you do not know that woman." "'Hush, boy, I will not listen to a word, unless you remember where you are,' said Sir John, with a commanding gesture. "'Remember your promise. Love me, forgive me, protect me, and do not listen to their accusations,' whispered Jean, whose quick eye had discovered the letters. "'I will. Have no fears, my child he answered, drawing her nearer as he took his accustomed place before the fire, always lighted when Mrs. Coventry was down. Gerald, who had been pacing the room excitedly, paused behind Lucia's chair as if to shield her from insult. Bella clung to her mother, and Edward, calming himself by a strong effort, handed his uncle the letters, saying briefly, "'Look at these, sir, and let them speak.' I will look at nothing, hear nothing, believe nothing which can in any way lessen my respect and affection for this young lady. She has prepared me for this. I know the enemy who is unmanly enough to belie and threaten her. I know that you both are unsuccessful lovers, and this explains your unjust, uncourteous treatment now. We all have committed faults and follies. I freely forgive Jean hers, and desire to know nothing of them from your lips. If she has innocently offended, pardon it for my sake, and forget the past." "'But, uncle, we have proofs that this woman is not what she seems. Her own letters convict her. Read them, and do not blindly deceive yourself,' cried Edward, indignant at his uncle's words. A low laugh startled them all, and in an instant they saw the cause of it. While Sir John spoke, Jean had taken the letters from the hand which he had put behind him, a favourite gesture of his, and unobserved had dropped them on the fire. The mocking laugh, the sudden blaze, showed what had been done. Both young men sprang forward, but it was too late. The proofs were ashes, and Jean Muir's bold bright eyes defied them, as she said with a disdainful little gesture, "'Hands off, gentlemen. You may degrade yourselves to the work of detectives, but I am not a prisoner yet. Poor Jean Muir you might harm, but Lady Coventry is beyond your reach.' "'Lady Coventry!' echoed the dismayed family, in varying tones of incredulity, indignation, and amazement. "'Aye, my dear and honoured wife,' said Sir John, with a protecting arm about the slender figure at his side, and in the act, the words, there was a tender dignity that touched the listeners with pity and respect for the deceived man. "'Receive her as such, and for my sake forbear all further accusation.' he continued steadily. I know what I have done. I have no fear that I shall repent it. If I am blind, let me remain so, till time opens my eyes. We are going away for a little while, and when we return, let the old life return again, unchanged, except that Jean makes sunshine for me as well as for you." No one spoke, for no one knew what to say. Jean broke the silence, saying coolly, May I ask how those letters came into your possession? In tracing out your past life, Sidney found your friend Hortense. She was poor, money bribed her, and your letters were given up to him as soon as received. 
"'Traitors are always betrayed in the end,' replied Edward sternly. Jean shrugged her shoulders, shot a glance at Gerald, saying with her significant smile, "'Remember that, monsieur, and allow me to hope that in wedding you will be happier than in wooing. Receive my congratulations, Miss Beaufort, and let me beg of you to follow my example, if you would keep your lovers.' Here all the sarcasm passed from her voice, the defiance from her eye, and the one unspoiled attribute which still lingered in this woman's artful nature shone in her face, as she turned toward Edward and Bella at their mother's side. "'You have been kind to me,' she said with grateful warmth. "'I thank you for it, and will repay it if I can. To you I will acknowledge that I am not worthy to be this good man's wife, and to you I will solemnly promise to devote my life to his happiness. For his sake, forgive me, and let there be peace between us.' There was no reply, but Edward's indignant eyes fell before hers. Bella half put out her hand, and Mrs. Coventry sobbed as if some regret mingled with her resentment. Jean seemed to expect no friendly demonstration, and to understand that they forbore for Sir John's sake, not for hers, and to accept their contempt as her just punishment. "'Come home, love, and forget all this,' said her husband, ringing the bell, and eager to be gone. "'Lady Coventry's carriage!' And as he gave the order, a smile broke over her face, for the sound assured her that the game was won. Pausing an instant on the threshold before she vanished from their sight, she looked backwards, and fixing on Gerald the strange glance he remembered well, she said in her penetrating voice, "'Is not the last scene better than the first? End of chapter 9 End of Behind a Mask, or a Woman's Power, by Louisa May Alcott